Listen, I'm going to talk about something that we titled Don't Cross the Line. And we're going to talk about being too familiar with people, leaders, bosses, church folk, or just maybe even your own spouse. How familiarity breeds contempt. How the sin of familiarity affects our lives and what it looks like and what it smells like and what it acts like and how do I know and throughout this message I'm going to you know define in several ways what this familiarity is what it means how it works because I do believe that we need to be careful because we're living in a society that's too familiar with everything where there's no boundaries people say what they want do what they want then the world gets mad at them for doing it. And that, that they, as long as they do it on the internet, it's somehow okay, or Facebook, or whatever. But we need to be people that protect ourselves even. Because to be honest with you, some people can never really be around leaders. And I know that sounds bad, and you say, why? Because it's not healthy for you or them. And so even in this relationship here, for some of us, the, the, the relationship we really need as Christians is, is the relationship you have here between a pastor and, a, and a, a, a Christian, a church member. See, some people think, well, if I just get to know him, you may get to know me and not like me. But, but you can receive from the gift within me or whoever's standing up here. Because I know leaders of all kinds of walks and, and all kinds of ways, and every leader I know is a little quirky. They have something about them. Maybe they have a bad temper. And some people can't handle that they, because you believe they should act the way you think they should act. Or you perceive they act. And it's an unhealthy attitude. Because ev there's no, how many of y'all know there's no perfection in this room? Yeah, only about half of you raised your hand. So the other half says, I'm perfect. <laughs> and so there's no perfection and so what, what we do is we put expectations on others, and if they don't fulfill our thoughts or how we think, then we're upset and we get hurt and we lose respect. And it may not be that they're doing anything wrong. It's just their temperament or their attitude, or maybe they use a few words that you don't like or you don't think they should use because we, we put expectations on people based on their position, based on who we think they should be. And this is not a license to sin. It's just the reality of our lives. Go, if you would, to the book of Luke, chapter 7. The book of Luke, chapter 7. And I'm going to read verses 36 through 50. And this is, this is about Jesus being asked to come and eat with a Pharisee. And, and, and really, the way you, the Pharisees and Sadducees were the religious people of the day. They were the ones that wanted to control everybody and everything. And you either did what they did, they were part of the Sanhedrin, or you did not. But they were the religious people. And if you notice throughout the scriptures, Jesus was very kind to sinners. He was very gracious. You don't ever hear him call a sinner a devil, but you'll hear him call the religious folks devils. Snakes and vipers. Because they should know better. They say they have a heart for God. And the worst people are the ones that say they have a heart for God, but really don't have a heart for God. They have a heart for themselves. Luke 7, 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. See, I told you. It happened. <laughs> I'm just mad. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, notice they actually described, she was an immoral woman. Brought a beautiful, was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Now, let's just build a picture. This Pharisee has probably seen Jesus out with the people. The Pharisees and religious people saw the miracles he did because he did so many. They said we wouldn't have enough books to fill, to put, you know, to, that we could fill up. There's, there's too many miracles for the books. 
So they saw this. It wasn't like they didn't know. They saw. They saw the multitudes. They saw the sick being healed and the demon possessed being free. And he invites them to his house. And then he says, if this guy was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is that is touching him. And I'm thinking, why would he say that? He, he saw what he did, and, and maybe it could be because when he finally met Jesus and invited him to his house, he sized him up. Well, he's, I'm much taller. I'm better looking. I dress better. I smell better. And now look at this guy. If he was really something or anything, he would know what that woman is. This is the beginning of being too familiar, even though he may not have known Jesus at all. Then Jesus answered, I love this, his thoughts. That should pull him back. Because he didn't say it, he thought it, and Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him the story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to another. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the first time I, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. Does anybody in here have many sins? Yeah. That's why we got to get away from bad teaching and bad thought processes. Well, I've done so much. Well, if you have many sins, I, I don't know what that number is, but many is many. Then you're the same way. We're all the same way. One reason I love Legacy Church, because a lot of us have had many sins. And when we've forgiven much, we love much. Okay. So I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Who's he rebuking? Him. The Pharisee. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So familiarity is when you get around somebody that you may know or you, you may know, but they may not know you. And then you begin to size them up and you begin to assess them and put expectations on them. And Jesus said to him, this is what's so bad. He said, when I came to your house... It was a courtesy in that day, because they wore open sandals, to offer them water or to have somebody or them wash their feet because of all the dust. It was customary to be greeted a certain way when you walked into a house. You know, when I came to New Mexico and I lived in Roswell, America, I got around the Sanchez family who are still dear friends of mine. And I would be invited to their home. And there was a whole bunch of kids. I mean, they, they, they we're all grown up, but there was a bunch. There was a big family. And Savino, who who's, who's, was one of the elders there, and now he works on staff. He's a city councilor. He, they would invite my wife and I over all the time. And I would sit there, and when one family member would come in, and there could be 30 people in the room. When one family member would come in, they would come in and look and start at one side and greet everybody in the house. And I'm watching this like, huh? Because us white folk were like, hey, <laughs> if you get that, you know. And so, and then I'd watch another family member, they'd do it. Well, I just figured, okay, that's when in Rome. And so I, I learned, we, we learned to greet people. 
So now when I walk into a room where there's a lot of people, I will try to greet everybody, at least, hi, how you doing, or whatever, because you, you learn the, what's customary. It was customary in this day for when you were invited. It wasn't like Jesus just showed up and said, I'm eating with you. He invited them in to treat them with some honor or respect. This Pharisee treated him with no respect because he wouldn't wash his feet, didn't anoint his head, didn't even kiss him. Now today, listen, that is not in our culture. <laughs> some dude walked up and kissed me and be like, dude, you better, you better stop that. <laughs> we shake hands. And some guys do it like strong, like, and they grab your other arm so you can't hug them. It's like the... <laughs> but think about the lack of respect. That this guy sized Jesus up however he did it. And said, I'm not even going to treat him with any kindness. And then he gets mad because Jesus has led a woman that's immoral. Who came in realizing who he was. And she gave him so much honor. And he gave her so much forgiveness. See, the sin of familiarity will will cause you to lose relationships, not gain them. And if you come at it with everybody should act the way you think they should act, then that's a problem. And I've been around those people. Well, pastor, I got around you and you didn't act the way I wanted you to act. Well, why do I have to act the way you think I should act? Can I act the way I think I should act? Not if it affects me adversely. And, and so you can't win that. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. See, we think when Jesus walked the earth that, I mean, we know he was crucified and beaten, but we think everything, everybody loved him. They did not love him. They treated him horribly. They said ugly things to him. That's why as Christians, you've got to realize, just because you're a Christian and God's loved you doesn't mean people aren't going to say ugly things to you. Well, if God really loved me, he'd stop that or do ugly things to you. We just, we just got to be careful that we, we think we're better than Jesus. And that's where the body cries, well, I'm a Christian. If God loved me, he would never let this happen. Are you kidding me? If that's the case, then Jesus missed God the whole time he was on the earth. Listen to what happened here. Mark chapter 6, verse 1. I'm going to read through verse 6. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed... They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Jesus says in these first six verses, he says amazed twice. He was amazed. Who heard him were amazed. The people were amazed because of the wisdom which, with, with which he spoke. Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter. Highlight that. The son of Mary. And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. So folks, if you come from a certain type of background, you are taught that Mary is equal to Jesus and Mary is equal to God. And that somehow Mary had Jesus and that was it. Mary consummated her relationship with her husband and they had many sons and many daughters. And that's not bad. That's actually good because they were married. But they called Jesus the son of Mary. And we think, oh man, that's great. It's not great. Let me finish. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed, there it is again, at their unbelief. So we say, what does all this mean? When they first said, isn't this a carpenter? Now, the, a carpenter wasn't an esteemed position or a, uh, a way of making a living back in those days. Today, we build our houses out of wood and we want carpenters or, you know, uh, metal studs, but we, we have carpenters and we honor them. They build the cabinets, we like them. But back then they built their houses out of brick and mud or stone and mud, I would say. And so it wasn't a very esteemed profession. It was, so first of all, they were demeaning him. Isn't this this guy a carpenter? Is that all he is? 
Because in Israel, again, carpentry was a humble trade. And in Nazareth, homes were made of stone and mud. And Jesus probably made a few tables. He probably made some uh, uh, chairs, some doors, maybe even some plows. But it wasn't when they said, isn't he a carpenter? They were, they were so familiar with him. They said, isn't that all he is? Who does he think he is? The first group was amazed at how much wisdom. And then they began to scoff. Look at him. He's just a carpenter. These people are dishonoring his profession. Secondly, they called him the son of Mary as opposed to the son of Joseph. Now, that was a slap in the face in this day. Because when they didn't call him the son of Joseph, they're ignoring his genealogy as a son of David, a son of Abraham. Joseph was of this lineage. And saying that he was the son of Mary could have also meant that they were insinuating that he was illegitimate. I mean, that's degrading at best. It's demeaning. So they say to him, and Jesus is watching this right there. They said, isn't he a carpenter? It'd be like whatever your profession is. That's all you are. You don't mean nothing. Come on. And then they said, come on, man. You're the son of Mary, which is basically saying you're illegitimate anyway. Who do you think you are? Because, listen, Mary got pregnant from God, right? The angel, right? The Spirit of God. She had this. She got pregnant. Then later on, she married her husband. So we can do the math. I'm sure they didn't have what we have. You know, you're, you're married, and six and a half months later, you have a baby and say it was just premature. <laughs> Even though the baby's like eight pounds and five ounces. It's like, that's a big preemie. <laughs> so it was demeaning. Their comments were degrading, condescending, and malicious even. And Jesus, they say, he just looked and said, man, I'm amazed at their unbelief. You see, familiarity means to know someone or something very well and in such a way as to cause you to lose your admiration, respect, and sense of awe. Surely this guy who got up and proclaimed himself the son of God can't be because he's just a carpenter. He's not, they wouldn't even dignify him by saying he's the son of Joseph. He's the son of Mary. Who does this guy think he is? I wonder if he came in and God really had Jesus come in as a king's kid. Like a a high position, wealthy. But oh no, Jesus came in humble. Because that's how we all have to come to him. And the sin of familiarity means I know someone so well and I lose respect because they're not basically acting the way I think they should. And they don't have the position they should. Who do you think you are? You're just this. You're just that. Anybody ever had that said to them? Who do you think you are? It was very degrading, condescending. This is what Jesus had to deal with. And he walked away amazed and said, are you kidding me? Really? Can you imagine? Just heal a few sick folk. Just watch what I can do. Boom, boom. You're healed. And we're good. But they still didn't believe because they couldn't get past being a carpenter and seeing him as not even legitimate or illegitimate. So to know someone or something very well and in such a way as to cause you to lose your admiration, respect, and sense of awe, presumptuous, where a person is too confident in a way that shows a lack of respect, See, this sin will leave you barren. It happened to King David. 2 Samuel chapter chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. This is a story where they go to Abadah's house and and, and they they get the ark of the covenant. They left it there and they begin to carry it back to where David was, where the the temple was. And and remember, they were carrying it and it started to fall off. And I think his name was Uzzah. He, he touched it to put it up and he died and David was angry with God. Are you kidding me? And I really think maybe even David was angry at himself because they didn't properly take care of the presence of God. They didn't properly do it the way it was supposed to. They did it in a hurry. They didn't do all the things they were supposed to do. And, and it fell and God says, you're not going to treat me like that. And we're not either. We shouldn't treat him like that either. We should come in the way he says to come in. And we should honor him with, 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 
with compassion, especially if our sins were many. And so David, they're coming in. He starts dancing before the Lord. And the Bible says in Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 20 through 23, when David returned home to bless his own family, Michal or Michael, however you want to say it, the daughter of Saul came out to meet him. She said in disgust, how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. Now, a lot of people think that David danced naked. The Bible says he was robed in priestly clothes. I don't believe he was ever just, you know, went to dancing before the Lord and became naked. I don't believe it. I don't think that's really right, but that's what you hear some people say. But he was dancing before the Lord as the king. In other words, he didn't care what you thought or anybody thought. He was just rejoicing. And his wife, Michael, Michael or Michal, however you want to say it, Hebrew or, or the way we would say it, comes out and begins to rebuke him. And I love David's response. David retorted to Michal, I was dancing before the Lord who chose, I love this, who chose me above your father and all his family. I'm sure if you say that to your wife today, you're not going to win many brownie points. <laughs> he appointed me as the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord, so I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, and I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls you mentioned will indeed think I am distinguished. So Michael, the daughter of Saul, remained childless throughout her entire life. Can I tell you something? When we don't do it right and we get off, it will leave us barren spiritually. You'll be wondering, why am I not bearing fruit? Maybe it's because you've become too familiar with leaders or spiritual leaders or maybe your boss that you're treating them in a way that not even God says is right. You can't do that. I've been around preachers that I could name them that have some different attitudes. You would know some of their names. And they have said things, and I'm like, whoa, wow. And I said to my, I would never say that. I've seen them get angry and lose their temper. I'm like, man, they need to control that. But here's what I've never done. I've never lost respect for the gift and the reality of who they are. And I've never demeaned them or degraded them. Because I know who has called them. Because, and then I know nobody's perfect. Now, I said this at the beginning. I'm not excusing bad behavior. It doesn't mean they have something they need to work on. But what if they're working on it and they just can't get a handle on it? I know some leaders. How many of y'all know bosses and leaders that have bad tempers? Yeah. How many of y'all know employees that have bad tempers? Yeah, we're all raising our hands. <laughs> But see what happens to a person that gets so familiar, they'll look at that and they'll begin to lose respect and degrade them and put them down and find fault with them. But the person that hurts the most is us. Now there's some leaders that, that have proved themselves to be wrong and just, just out of touch and, 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 be, and they, they won't repent. I get that. We just stay away from them. But if we're going to be around people, leaders, bosses. We want to be in a place where we can be around people that maybe even can help us grow because I believe you should have three types of relationships. I think you should have relationships where someone's here and you're here. I think you should have these relationships where it's even and, and you guys are on the same plane. And then I think you should have relationships where you're here and someone's here. So you're always helping and then you're always being helped. Because some people just want to hang around their own group. You know, that's why I, I, I and, and I'm going to say this, and it might not fit right. That's why I'm concerned when people come in and they're 19, 20, 23, 25, and they said, you have a group just for me. Yeah, it's called the dream team, the body of Christ. And you say, why is that? Because if they don't have all these relationships, then they're, then they're not going to be as healthy as they could be. And when I got saved, they didn't have a youth group or a singles group. They didn't have a young person's group. You just went to church. And most of the people I went to church were old people like me. I mean, they were probably 35, and I'm thinking they're old people. And I just went to church, and they said, get involved, and I got to know people. 
And, and we need to be careful that we don't isolate ourselves. I want to be around this kind of person. Well, I'm only comfortable being around this type of person. I know, but you need to get to a place where you step out of your comfort zone and get around people that maybe have done more than you or have achieved more than you so you can learn and grow. But you can never, and God won't even open those doors if you can't handle yourself. I'm not looking to find fault with leaders. I'm just not. No leader is perfect. Leaders have different quirks. One of my quirks that people say is I introduce people like five times. Have you met so-and-so? Have you? I don't know why I'm like that. I just want everybody to know everybody. <laughs> Hug it out. <laughs> and here, Michael ends up barren because she got so familiar with David that she dishonored him. In marriages, it can happen the same way. Two people get married, they love each other, and they lose respect for each other because I know so much about her and she knows so much about me. And you, 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 you hold that to an account. You, you take an account of the suffered wrongs or the, the things that someone has. And then you begin to go at each other. And then it breaks down and you're done. Well, he's this and she's that. And there may be some, not, not, like, listen, I always have to say this. There may be some things that are beyond repair. I'm just talking about a normal relationship dealing with normal stuff, okay? I'm not talking about the extremes. And some would say, well, Pastor Steve, some of the extremes are normal, are normal today. I'm not talking about beating each other up and fighting. I mean, we can argue, but we can't touch each other in a bad way. Women, don't you be hitting your man, because if your man decides to hit you back, you're going to be. And I, now I've, I got to say this, too. I've met some women that can beat up their husbands. And I always think, dude, why would you marry someone that can whoop you, man? Go find someone that, you know. <laughs> Years ago, I was in Bible school, and this guy came in, and I was with the counselors. And they said, yeah, he came in. I said, we're giving him counseling. I said, why? Because his wife abuses him. I said, what does that mean? She whoops him. And I said, oh, he just doesn't want to hurt her. He said, oh, no, no, no. He can't whoop her. And he was a little old scrawny looking dude. And I said, where's the wife? And they showed me the wife. She was a big, like, bo I said, oh, man, dude, what were you thinking? <laughs> dude, sober up. Think about this. <laughs> but in marriages, it happens a lot. You hear it in counseling, you know, the, he does this, she does this, he does this. And it's not like it's awful or bad. It's just, it's just I have an expectation and... And, and, and we don't let people change, and we, don't, we just don't work things out. And familiarity happens in marriages, and that's why so many of them that... And I'm not talking about the extreme things, the fighting, you know, the beating, the drug abuse. I'm talking about just normal living where we're not perfect beings. Because I think it's important that we be able to look that. Cynthia knows everything about me and some things she can't stand. I know it. And there's things about her, to be honest with you, that I can't stand. But it is her. And she said, it is him. And I just don't take an account of it. It's just the way she is. So, okay, I'm just going to live with it and deal with it. And I'm sure she has to say that a lot about me. Because there's a lot of things I don't do well and I don't do right. But then we, we realize that nobody's perfect. Familiarity causes you to see other faults and causes you to begin to compare yourself with them or compare them to others. You lose respect because of what you think, not of how they really acted, but how you think they should act. The better we know people, the more likely we are to find fault with them. That's from the new dictionary of cultural literacy. Familiarity breeds contempt. Maybe you've heard that statement. That's the feeling. Contempt is the feeling that a person or a thing is beneath consideration, worthless, or deserving scorn. The state of despising. That I become so, I, can, I have so much contempt for them. Now, I want to say this again because I always, people walk out of here, I don't want you thinking. Now, there is such situations where sometimes the, the relationships is, is unrepairable. That maybe, maybe someone doesn't want to quit drugs or someone is really abusive. You don't want to be in that relationship. You want to be safe. So I get that. So understand that. But in a normal relationship, in fact, I want to say this before I close that there's only five tickets left, and the tickets is for a couple, 
So only 10 spots left because I can't imagine a single guy or a single woman wanting to go to a Valentine's banquet. I, you know, I, I can't. But maybe you want to. There's only five tickets left and then it's sold out. So whoever procrastinated, dude, we tried. See, when we become so f- too familiar with authority, it will cost us. Maybe for some, it's why things aren't fruitful, blessed in their lives. And we live in a nation that is so familiar with everything that we, we don't respect. How about this one? People even get too familiar with the church. See, the church is treated as a man-made thing and not God-created. This is why people don't attend or, or don't attend as often as they should. People don't serve, they don't give because we think and people think, it gets so familiar, this is a man-made thing. People will say, you know, you've heard them say, I'm not going to do man-made religion. Really? Wow, what does that mean? That anybody who says, hey, we believe something or have a vision and go and doing it, I'm not going to do that because that's man-made. Here, let me say this to you. The church is God-created, not man-made. This whole thing is God-created. And I'm going to prove it to you. How many of you in here would say, Since you've gotten to know Christ, he is or has changed your life. Listen, can I tell you something? All the education in the world is not going to do that. How many say you've been delivered from from drugs or something like that? Yeah. So so can I say something? They say just educate, educate. And then the the drug epidemic is as bad as anything. It's, It's the worst it's ever been. The opioid thing. It's so awful. And and yet we think education, no, it's God in us it's God doing it in us and God created this is a God created thing that's why you got to be careful how you treat it I've had people say to me Pastor Steve can you talk to the people about talking during church I'm trying to listen and there's a couple in front of me talking about the grocery list they need to go buy after church wow I, I just can't imagine that I can't imagine sitting in church talking to my wife about the grocery list I can't imagine talking to my wife about the grocery list at all, ever. (laughs) But especially in church. And people have conversations. They'll get on their phone and talk like loud. It's like we can hear you. It's like people don't even know what a whisper is. Hey. Yeah, whisper. Hey. No, whisper. Hey. (laughs) And you know why? Because maybe they perceive the house of God. And they're so familiar with it. They think it's man-made instead of God-created. God created this. He created the institution of the church. In fact, Jesus said he's the head of the church. Let me read it. Colossians 1.18 says, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead, so he is first in everything. Not second, in everything. And because this is God-created... We shouldn't get so familiar that we, we don't make it a habit to come to church, if you would. That it's a priority in our life. Look at some of you, uh, or so many of you coming out on a midweek and having your children in the children's church. I'm telling you, it'll bless your life. If you stay consistent, it'll bless your world, it'll bless your life. And, and when you realize how great, and it's God created, and Jesus said that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some pastors and evangelists and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He gave them so we could mature and grow and not be blown around by every wind of doctrine. Because the greatest Christian is the stable Christian. Not one that's too high or too down, but somewhere in the middle. Because we're we're flowing, there's a flow to our life. And if it's God created, we better start treating it like it's God created. That's why people have come in here and they've said to me, new people, said you could tell when you walked in the sanctuary, there's no nonsense here. You're not going to put up with nonsense. You just feel it. And I'm like, oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Yeah. When Jesus. Okay. But that's the way it should be. And you know who sets that tone? You do. You're the one that sets the tone when people come in and say, this is no nonsense because you're no nonsense. Because we know this is God created, not man created. This is not man made, but God created. 
So we treat the house of God in a way that is, is right, is honorable. That's why we serve and that's why we give. That's why we do those things. Because we realize it's God created. God created this place. And now I know there's no scripture how we do worship. We just do it this way because it's the way we know to do it. There's no scripture to how to receive the offering. Some people have told me in the past, well, in my church, we just put it in boxes and they never say anything about it. Great. So they're missing the big, one of the biggest part of the gospel. Just because they don't talk about it doesn't make it right. I said, well, we don't do it that way. We put, we pass buckets, but we also have things you can go put it in. We have offering boxes all over the church. You can go drop your offering in. I mean, however you want to do it, whatever floats your boat. Same way with serving. If you think it's man-made, because some of us come from a background where the church is equal to God, and maybe even more so than God. And when I say God, I'm talking about the Word of God, because that's how we know God. And can I tell you something? There's nothing equal to the Word of God. The Word of God is set up here, and everything else is down here. But Jesus is the head of the church. And if he's the head of the church, that means he established it. So we could come together, and you, could, you can be ministered to and minister because of the gifts and callings of God that he's placed in all of us. All of us have some gifts and callings that God desires for us to use for the body of Christ's benefit, which will in turn bless you. But we eliminate ourselves because we, could, we become so familiar with things that we'll even eliminate ourselves because I've messed up, I did this, I did that. Why eliminate yourself? God never did and God never will. Quit eliminating yourself. If you're here and you've had many sins, you're a candidate for everything God has. And when he forgives much, we love much. And it doesn't mean you'll ever be perfect, guys, because we continually to fight through our stuff every day. And here's what you got to know. God loves you. He cares for you. And he wants you in his family. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for protecting all of our hearts and minds from the sin of familiarity. That we get so familiar with people and things and uh, institutions that, Father, we, we begin to lose respect or the awe is gone or the reverence. May we, may we embrace your honor, your dignity. God, you know everything about everyone in this room, all of us, and you still love us. You're still willing to work with us. You're still willing to forgive us. But we have to be willing to come to you in a humble heart. Not in a heart that I deserve something because we don't deserve anything. What you give to us, you give because you love us, not because we earned it or deserve it. And may we see the house of God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, from this moment on as God created not man-made. Help us, Lord, to never become so familiar with you that we treat you with disrespect and dishonor. And Father, one of the ways we, we make sure we don't is when we blow it, we repent. And we repent and we say, God, forgive us. Forgive me. I'm going to purpose to do it right. And we may do it wrong again, but I'm going to do it right. I'm going to do it right until you get it right. Because God said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. But if you're in this place right now in Jesus' name, with every head bowed, and listen, I'm not going to call you for it. I'm going to pray with you right where you're seated. I'm going to do this quickly. If you're here and you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I've walked with the Lord, but I've walked away. I just want to come home. I just want to get it right. I want to know that I know that if I die today, that I would end up in heaven, in his heaven. But I walked with him. I walked away. Maybe you're here and you've never given God permission to your life. You've never said yes to him in a way where you intend on following him. Your intention is say yes and learn to follow him. If you haven't done that, this is your moment. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. God is saying this is the best moment for you. Well, pastor, I'm going to go get my life right. Then come to Christ. It doesn't work that way. You give your life to Christ and then he'll help clean up your life. And he'll give you the power to do so. He's not afraid of the sinner. He's not afraid of those of us that have made mistakes. He actually loves us. Loves you. If that's you with every head bowed and you say, Pastor, would you include me in your prayer? I'm going to ask you to do two things. One, real quick. And right now in Jesus' name. If that's you in Jesus' name, would you please lift your hand in this place? Is anybody here? It says, Pastor, this is my moment. I'm going to look across the church. I just want to see your hand up. You can put it down. Ushers, if you'll help me. Thank you. God bless you. As I look across the top, who else up there would join these? Thank you. God bless you. 
Who else? The ushers will help me. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. So look across the bottom saying, God bless you. God bless you, sir. Who else before we close? Guys, I never have a sad story to tell you because it's not my job to work you. God bless you. It's the Holy Spirit's responsibility, and I believe that he's working in hearts and minds and trying to convince you that he is the right way. But you have to yield to him. You have to do something. We have to come to him and humble our hearts, regardless of what position you have in life. You've got to quit saying, what will people think, and start saying, what does God know? Who else, before we close, will say, preacher, this is my day. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, I pray for each one. I pray you bless them. Give them courage, Father, to walk with you in Jesus' name. If you lifted your hand, I'm going to have you stand to your feet, and I'm going to pray with you that way. So would you stand? So I, I know who you are, and you're saying, God, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I, I'm going to stand. If one, will you, one of you stand, all, all of you stand, I, I believe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Just stand to your feet. God bless you. God bless you. Just remain standing. God bless you. All of you stand. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Because God loves you. If you lifted your hand, just stand. And we're going to pray because if you're not willing to acknowledge God like this, how are you going to do it in the world where people are against you? We're, how many of you are here for these people? We're for you. And, and we all had to do the same thing, Father, in Jesus' name, for all those standing, so many. May you bless them. May you make your face to shine upon them. May you be good to them. May they learn to know you and know your ways. May they follow you. It's not a prayer that, that just gets it done. It's the intention to follow you, to learn your ways and realize how great and good you really are. This is the year of healing and restoration where people can experience the long-suffering grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. May they experience that today in Jesus' name. If you're standing, I want you to pray this prayer loud to me right where you're standing. I want everybody in here to join us with them. So if you're standing, you're not praying alone, everybody around you will be praying. Would you pray, Father? I believe that Jesus is your son and that on the third day you raised him from the dead to give me a new life. And so now with my heart, I believe. And now with my mouth, I willingly confess Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. I am blessed, highly favored, because now I'm a son. I'm a daughter of the Most High God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, let's thank the Lord, church.